Yeah, go for it. All right, hello, hello. Thank you for uh, coming to our talk. Forensic fish tank, breaking down analysis of advanced fishing emails. And I'll start by uh, letting Joe introduce himself. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Gray. I'm a senior security architect. Uh, 2017 DerbyCon Social Engineering Capture the Flag winner. Uh, last year, the Password Inspection Agency got third place in the OSINT CTF. Um, when I came down, uh, we're in third place again this year. So if anyone has any specific information relating to Jim Nitterauer, Security Panda, or Damon Small, please uh, send a DM on Twitter to uh, DFIR noob. Uh, Chris did say we could uh, crowdsource the uh, flags, <laughs> so uh, I can't compete right now. So if you want to help out, go for it. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'm writing a book with uh, No Starch Press right now as well. So that's pretty much me. Oh, All right. My name is Sophia Fowley. For those who don't know me, I am um, the founder of Besides Nova, back, uh, established back in 2016. We just done our third uh, con um, in March. Um, I'm also a blue teamer for an insurance company. I uh, speak three languages, so if anybody needs translation to French, or I can help. <laughs> uh, I try to mentor whenever I have time, and I'm also a Nova Hacker member uh, back in Virginia. A uh, little disclaimer, uh, none of the views or thoughts in this uh, presentation reflect those of the organizations we work for or represent. So, all right. So to kind of define the objectives, we're going to look at things both offensively and defensively, so kind of in a purple team sense. Um, so on the offensive perspective, we're going to look at considerations of spoofing versus squatting. Uh, a little bit about payloads and links, not anything too heavy there, uh, as well as timing and um, the infrastructure and uh, evasion when necessary. Um, defensively, we'll look at, of course, the mitigation detection and um, key operator here, attempted attribution. Yeah. <laughs> attempted is the key word. Um, so the basics of social engineering. Uh, what is human hacking? Um, it's basically the ability for social engineer to manipulate a victim's frame of, 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 uh, of reference. Um, it's the arts of persuasion. Uh, you, the social engineer have the ability to motivate the victim to do what they want, they need them to do. Uh, we see this, we, we see this kind of attempt every day, um, on ads, right? Marketing organizations try to manipulate our thought to get us to purchase, to feel the need that we have to if we want to look cool or... All, all sorts of things with building reports. Um, car salesmen are probably the most infamous social engineers. Um, they probably are some of the l most poorly trained, but they're there as well. So sales and marketing, basically social engineering and open source intelligence just with a different outcome. Yeah. So looking at the types of social engineering, um, it, it typically, social engineering does usually result in a dumpster fire. Your mileage may vary. Um, but with this presentation, we're going to focus on phishing, but know that you have vishing and smishing as well. Uh, there's the whole physical security aspect of sneaking in places, lock picking, um, subverting those types of systems, dumpster diving, and baiting as well. Um, so uh, digging into social engineering just to kind of set the tone for this. Um, <clears throat> I get this question a lot of, I want to get into social engineering, what do I need to study? These are the five things I say you should study, but in this presentation, we're really going to focus on the acting infosec and psychology portions. Uh, if you bring in vishing, then you've got some improv associated with it as well. And then, of course, doing this in an ethical sense, more than likely for hire, uh, there's going to be some technical writing, but that's kind of unwritten because everything requires some sort of technical writing. So let's get into the actual idea of like the sending the email piece. So which targets are you going to go for? Um, in a consulting role, will the customer slash victim slash target give you the email addresses that you're going to target, or are you left to your own devices via open source intelligence, OSINT, to do this? Um, in terms of protections, can you enumerate any protective mechanisms they may have, like proof point, mimecast, that kind of fun stuff? Uh, are they using something um, like SPF or DMARC uh, to filter the mail um, 
What kind of timeline are you looking at for doing this? Uh, like in a consulting role, do you have two hours to send a fish to 30,000 people, or do you have like 12 hours to fish, I mean, 100 people? That's going to dictate how complex you can get. Uh, with that, what kind of payload are you going to do? Um, I classify from the vein of phishing uh, collection of passwords to be a payload of sorts, because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do. But it could also be an actual file uh, of some sort of malware, such as like a macro-enabled Word document. You could build something in, say, uh, Venom or Empire or something like that. Uh, or it could just be click the link, and then the link can handle the dirty, the dirty business for you. Um, do you want to go manual? Do you want to go automated? Uh, there are benefits to each. Uh, I personally uh, don't care for going the automated approach. I prefer to craft everything by hand and get it out the door uh, because I could actually take a little bit more time and not have anything that's going to uh, set off any alarms for, hey, this was done with like a fishing kit or uh, this was done with like Kingfisher or, or uh, Social Engineer Toolkit or some of those solutions. I mean, they're good. It's just typically whenever I'm doing these types of engagements, I have far better success with manual um, testing. So uh, there's always other considerations. Uh, it could vary based on the organization or uh, just the country you're in. Uh, for example, if you're um, targeting someone in the European Union, there's those four pesky letters that all the salespeople are trying to cram down our throats in GDPR. So uh, keep that kind of stuff in mind. So looking at the offensive angle, um, let's take a look at the OSINT of this. And um, Things like the MX record, it's necessary uh, within DNS for uh, emails to actually be able to be sent and received. Uh, SPF, the sender policy framework, that is meant as a mechanism that's supposed to help you filter the emails so that you're only getting legitimate stuff. And then who is? Uh, that's always out there to find out who owns what. But the beautiful thing is, uh, just like tools like, say, Nmap or even a hammer, is it a weapon or is it a tool? And it all depends on intent. There are methods, which uh, I have a short demo at the very end, that we can actually go through and exploit uh, various things within Whois and other records to be able to get information that's going to help us with the phishing campaign, uh, specifically out of Recon NG. But you should also probably check the careers pages, um, see if they're hiring uh, someone for an email security appliance. Companies infamously tell too much information about themselves on social media. Uh, on social media, for one, but also on the careers page, because, I mean, most people don't just blindly apply to a position. If you, like, for example, if you're a database administrator, you may be good in MySQL and MS SQL, but you may only be good in one or the other, so to try to streamline the application process, companies typically say, I'm looking for one or the other, and then in the, from the OSINT perspective, we're we are able to read and say, hey, well, they say they have MS SQL, so chances are they're a Microsoft shop too, so uh, time to break out those Windows exploits. Um, but then also, there's a website, hunter.io, we'll look at that later as well, and a tool that's now built into Kali called Inspy. Uh, it's not installed by default, it's just app get install uh, inspy and it's right there. The only thing you need is an API key to hunter.io which is free. Uh, and you do that and it will query hunter.io for the email syntax and then it will query LinkedIn for employees of said company and build you a target list. So pretty awesome for that. And then of course uh, SPF, DKIM or DMARC. So, um, to kind of set the stage on that, basically all three of them are uh, different um, frameworks uh, of sorts that are supposed to filter mail. It's supposed to ensure that it is coming from who it's supposed to come from, it's not being spoofed, and this person is authorized to send emails into this organization. Um, SPF has already had holes shot in it like Swiss cheese, so it's really not that effective anymore. Uh, there are some vulnerabilities within DKIM, um, but not too many, and that's domain keys identified mail. And then the other one, which if you look back to late 2017 into 2018, was the entire crux of uh, certain vendors' uh, email pitch uh, to sell uh, solutions. Uh, the federal government, through binding, oper 
binding operating directive 1801 mandated that all agencies uh, implemented DMARC. So, of course, the vendors did what vendors do, and that was like their whole marketing thing of thou shalt do this. Um, some social engineering in itself. Um, <laughs> if they are configured correctly, they can stop spoofing in its tracks. They don't really work too much against squatting uh, unless you explicitly uh, define that it has to come from this domain. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's it works sometimes, but most of the time it won't. So I've mentioned squatting. Let's let's think about how the squatting would work. So you want to know the syntax of the email addresses. So do they use first dot last or first initial last name? last name, first and middle initial, what? And hunter.io is going to help you with that. You can go and look, you type into the domain, it'll tell you, hey, this is the syntax used. Um, you want to find out what domains they own. So if they own uh, something.net and the .com is available, buy it. If that doesn't work, then you can always go with like .us, um, which that one I don't really care for because you can't use whoisguard. You must say it is you. Uh, but you can do some other ones like .tk, but that's a little bit sketchy because a lot of malware uses that because it's a free domain. But you can also buy others like .info uh, or .life or something like that. They're like 99 cents. Um, but anyway, you purchase a sim similar domain. You determine what kind of mail client you're going to use. You can set it up yourself. You could put it through your hosting provider if you want to use like Bluehost or something like that. I personally like to use Google Apps, and I'll explain why uh, on the next slide. But um, it's it's definitely worth it. Um, and then, of course, you need to wait a week, a couple of weeks, because a lot of filtering solutions look for the age of the domain. If the age of the domain is like less than two weeks, it's going to drop it. And I mean, that's a good practice. But what I do is I just buy a bunch of domains and then wait sometimes more than a year, and then I finally use them for something. Like uh, I don't remember the actual top level domain, but one I have is like password hyphen reset, and I've used that three times and I've owned it for like four years. So it's uh, it's fun for that. And then of course, seek and destroy. So what if I told you you could do all this for under $25? Pretty easy. So you get you a VPS interest instance. I like DigitalOcean. You can use a $5 box. Uh, so you're, you're not doing any like hardcore um, web traffic, you don't want the public internet to be on this, you don't want the bots and scanners looking at it, so a $5 box will be more than sufficient for what you're trying to do. Uh, so $5, we're there right now. Purchase your two domains. You need the sender domain for your squatting, and that's going to be the more expensive of the two, that's going to run you probably about 15, uh, unless you go with like a .io, which will be like maybe 32 I think it is. Uh, but nevertheless, you have that, and then you get your landing domain, something like CGI-bin or password reset or something like that. You get it, and whenever you stand this up, what I've done in the past is I have a perfect clone of SurveyMonkey, and I go to the company's website, I steal a high-res logo, and I slap it on there asking for email address and password. I pass it via the GET request, so I don't have to maintain a database. So it's way faster to stand up. I have a vanilla instance that doesn't have a logo in it, um, and the, the server itself, I've got an ISO for it. So every time I do this with a customer, I stand up a new one, finish the engagement, close it, and then next time, spin up off that ISO again. So it's clean in that sense, and I don't have to stand up any database instances or any of that, so that definitely makes life a lot easier. But anyway, when you do this, and you configure the uh, actual Apache web server piece of it, you give it a really long subdomain. If you can take up the whole uh, address bar, more power to you. Uh, sometimes people are going to open it on their phone, so that works out there as well. Uh, for example, if I were going to do one here, I would do like uh, NOLACon Information Security Conference, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Attendee Satisfaction Survey, .cgi-ben.tk. <laughs> so people are going to catch on to it, but at the end of the day, when we're doing these types of engagements, we're not necessarily targeting the people in this room, we're targeting more of the people that we seek to protect. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so then we we get the two domains for that. Um, once you have it set up, I mean, we, we all remember the time that we were told that if it has the green lock, it's safe, right? Well, Let's Encrypt allows you to do that for free. So no additional cost there. Um, do your OSINT. 
get everything together. For the email portion itself, um, the Google part, that adds $5. So at this rate, we're $5 for Google, we're $5 for DigitalOcean, we're about $14 for the sending domain, and we're at like $0.99 cents for the landing domain. So that comes to like 25 and some change, depending if you have sales tax and all that fun stuff. So it's definitely under 30 um, So you do that, you do your OSINT. I like to steal direct quotes from press releases to put in there. Uh, if I can catch someone with an out of office, I will actually steal their signature as well. And then when it comes in, it's going to come from mail.google.com. Even though it's a different domain, the incoming mail server is only going to see it as mail.google.com. And while that could be blocked, for the most part, who in their right mind is going to block Google from sending inbound emails? I mean, that's going to shut down HR. That's going to shut down a lot of other things. So it's just not practical. So it's like, what are you going to do? And then, of course, you wait. So wait for the results, get your fun and profit, and then go uh, go with it from there. So I'm going to pass the floor over to uh, Sophia. All right. So as far as defense, what do we do uh, when it comes to protecting our uh, users? Well, some of the things as far as mitigation, um, as most of you know, uh, one of the weakest links in security has been the human. Um, so I'll start by saying that user education is number one. Um, new employee campaigns, um, make sure you have a monthly for every uh, set of employees that you get. Targeted campaigns seem to be more efficient also. Um, the things that your finance department will fall for are not the same as the marketing department uh, or your HR. Um, even um, how many of you have had uh, one of their employees of the security team fall for a phishing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty funny. Um, I had this uh, employee who reported the fish, then clicked the link. So. <laughs> um, so, and also continuous training. Um, we, by, by nature, we get too complacent, too comfortable in our environment. We think we know it all. Um, and before you know it, we, we forget to be cautious. Uh, we sometimes, some of us rely too much on, on the tools, think we're fully protected. Uh, so continuous training is a must, uh, monthly if necessary. Um, tagging emails, external emails. Having a banner that clearly states that this is an email coming from external source. I personally, from experience, have seen uh, a, a reduced success rate to our uh, simulated phishing campaign just by adding the banner itself. Now, uh, the number of reporting phishing will go up, even for legitimate emails, but nonetheless, uh, it protects from uh, those phishing ones. At least it brings some caution to the whole process. Um, again, properly configured DNS um, has been uh, a, a big uh, point for mitigation, um, just like Joe described. And and I'll you know most of us don't know or are very familiar with these frameworks, but. SPF basically relies on IPs. It tells uh, the organization what IPs come from what domain. Uh, DKIM is basically an encryption framework that uh, basically validates which email comes from what domain, right? And then you have DMARC who combines the two. Uh, the fourth thing that I can think of is basic uh, enforcing of separation of user accounts. Um, hopefully, you're not using your admin uh, credential uh, to surf the web. Um, and, and, and simple things that can be done to mitigate um, and evading phishing attacks. Um, when it comes to detections, uh, email security tools. Um, again, these are products, Proofpoint, Mimicast, Fire. Far right. Those are just examples of tools that you may see throughout your organization. We, by uh, no means, support or endorse these tools. These are just an uh, example um, of, of tools that help with malware protection, attachment sandboxing, right? Uh, URL rewriting. Um, this one will record if anybody clicked on a URL, if it got allowed, if it was denied. Um, if an active block is in place, if finally your tool um, detects that uh, a URL is a credential harvester. So 
then you know that everyone, even if they click on it, it will be eventually blocked. Um, rely on, on your thread intel feed, vet a thread intel feed to the tool, which hopefully will email, will quarantine some emails. Um, putting blocks or permit senders. Um, if you notice an email address that's targeting your ELT, you can go, go and put um, a, uh, a block for that email address so that it prevents further emails from targeting your ELTs. Um, they also have spam filtering. Uh, so these are basic things that come with the security tools that can be easily implemented in the company. Uh, now next, Joe is going to take a, a shot at attempted attribution, and we really want to enforce two keywords right, attempted yeah. here. Um, if we could have made the font any bigger uh, for attempted, <laughs> we probably would have, uh, solely on the fact of just to make it more obvious that we're not saying you can always do attribution, depending on who the adversary is. If it's a very complex, like, say, nation state, uh, those of you who are playing uh, buzzword bingo, uh, go ahead and hit your card, take a drink, whatever you're doing. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> depending on the uh, complexity of the adversary, you may have a hard time performing attribution. Uh, you may do incorrect attribution even. So it's something to consider. Uh, but there are tools out there that could help. And basically, uh, your best bet is to see where the things exist, uh, where the characteristics of this specific campaign exist otherwise. And you might not be able to say, this was Dimitri in St. Petersburg, Russia doing this, but you can say that this is associated with Locky ransomware. Right. So that's something to consider. And a few tools, I, I'm all about free. Uh, so Alien Vault has OTX, uh, there's Threat Miner, Threat Crowd, uh, Passive Totals, another one. Uh, IBM has the uh, X-Force Threat Exchange. And then, of course, SANS has the uh, Internet Storm Center to give information about that. So uh, at this point, I'm going to do a few quick uh, demos. Uh, so just going to end the slideshow momentarily. I think this Mac's like really new. I'm not used to it yet. So just trying to get to what I'm looking for here. Um, I have not done any sacrifices. So uh, what I will do is I'll just drag and drop. So we'll start. This is um, what I'm about to drag over is a smish that I received claiming to be from SunTrust. Um, and the beautiful thing is I never use SunTrust. So uh, <laughs> basically, uh, I just got it saying that something had happened with Amazon. So I did what any curious person with too much time on their hands yet overcommitted would do. I opened it up in Cali just to see what's going on because I had Cali running. So, uh, it's just going to that, uh, drag and drop it into virus total, see what's going on, see if anything identifies it as being malicious. So, nothing. So, so this is the uh, SunTrust uh, site to go to. When I say SunTrust site, I mean site. As we see, it's going to like Elder Care Weekly or something, which is a, a, an Australian nursing home. So basically, their site had been compromised, and this was stood up. So when we run that domain, it, it shows up some more. So um, now we're getting it in. So it's asking for user ID and password. So I've got all this bogus information over here. Let me see if I can move this over a little bit more so we can actually see it. There we go. So got all this fake information, so I'm just copying and pasting things in here. So there's the fake password. So I also ran all this stuff through Burp Suite and uh, took a look at the actual code behind it. And it was actually a pretty well-written uh, piece of code. So. Honestly, whoever did it was very talented. Uh, there's a fake credit card number if you want to use it. Uh, it 
Uh, if you want to take it down, it's 4867530990357684. Um, so I fed it some garbage there. Uh, for the pen, of course, 1337. And, and this uh, social is actually a retired um, wallet manufacturer. It's a retired social because a wallet manufacturer took his secretary's social and made copies of it to put in all the wallets to ship out in 1938. So, uh, got that information. Just, I'm just feeding it garbage and trying to see what it's doing. And for the uh, email address, I put security at suntrust.com. So in case they try to fish them, you can get to the right location. There's the bogus address on Rodeo Drive. Uh, now it's asking for email password. Just go ahead and drop that in there too. And then it actually redirects. So so it actually takes you to legit SunTrust, which I don't want to hate on SunTrust, but they probably should have been watching for redirections into their page. So I mean, I don't know how long this had been stood up. I I may have been one of the first to catch it, or it may have been going on for ages. The fact that Virus Total had already got some stuff on it, I'm going to say it probably wasn't new, but uh, as a byproduct, like that's the rest of the domain that was compromised that they were using. So, um, if it were on Virus Total, I'm going to say it was probably around for a little while. But let that be a lesson to uh, watch your Sims. So, um, additionally, I've uh, got some stuff here on the web front. Um, actually, we'll do this one first. So, I'm just going to show you the... Um, Listen for Yep. So, I'm going to show some stuff out of uh, Recon NG. If I can get my window to shrink here. Trying to see if I could convert this over, but there we go. So let me move this over. And here, this is just a Cali box. Uh, I'm already in Recon NG. I've already established uh, the uh, initial information. So this is the uh, MX SPF IP module. So all you have to do with it is have an internet connection and set your source. In this case, I'm just going after the Fortune 1 because they're huge and this is more or less very, um, just looking at it is rather uh, safe. So just like Metasploit, we say run. So we've got some stuff. So here's some net blocks. There's a Facebook domain verification, Adobe. So now we know they use Creative Cloud. It's not a surprise they have Facebook. There's some uh, IP ranges that we've got to work with, uh, SPF record, Google site verification. Oh, there's DocuSign. There's something we could use for phishing. Mm -hmm. And then right here we see this uh, MXA and MXB, all that. PP hosted is actually Proofpoint. So if we were going to attempt a phishing expedition against uh, Walmart, we would know that we could probably use DocuSign as a pretext, but at the same time, uh, we should be prepared to do battle with uh, Proofpoint. So uh, more than likely, they're either going to prepend or append the word external. So um, I would like to think that that works a lot more frequently than um, it, in my experience, I've seen organizations that do it that uh, you're able to blow right past them. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. 
uh, because at the end of the day, it all goes back to the user training. If you train the users to do it, then um, then they'll they'll be your champions. You just have to you have to let them know that you trust them. And apparently, this VM is not cooperating. So I'm just gonna do something here. I'm just gonna force quit it. Okay, so now once I find my cursor, here we go. So this is just an um, a pulse I created based on a phishing campaign. Uh, it has a lot of information. Um, it's on Alien Vault OTX. Um, in my previous position, I was an Alien Vault instructor, so I had to create pulses for class all the time. So I got tired of just giving dummy information and just started creating real ones based on what my honeypots were seeing. So here we're able to see there's some hashes, uh, some IP addresses, some URLs, domains, uh, host names, and then as we scroll down, we can just see there's some hashes and some IP addresses uh, and what have you. So with this, uh, I'm going to copy and paste this IP address into another utility that's fun to use uh, called Threat Miner. So with this, it's just looking for the host, and it's going to query other things in, in addition to OTX. Uh, it's going to geolocate it, so we have that going on here. It's giving us some information about the ASN, so we can drag and drop that into, say, Fish Tank and see if it's still live and active. Uh, that's uh, fishtank.com, if I recall correctly. Um, but this was actually Google, so it's probably wrong. Um, so we can click here, get uh, OTX. There's passive total, virus total, uh, census, Shodan, um, Robotex, all the fun stuff here. So you can definitely look and see what it's tied to. Um, we can take a hash here and do the same thing. I think they accept SHA-256. So with this one, we'll just go back and search again. So we've got the sample and right there, but it's that's the the pulse that uh, I was referring to. So mm -hmm. uh, you have other things you can look at with it as well. So it's just a good place to pivot. Like if you say, for example, you get an email, you think it's a fish, you want to do some further verification for it, take the email address, the IP address, whatever, and drop it in here. And it's it's not a it's not an absolute solution, but nothing is. It's just going to give you a starting point. So, um, and then the other thing I mentioned was hunter.io. So in this case, we'll just take a look at Walmart. I'm logged in, so um, you have to have an account, but like I said, it's free. Well, I have a free account. So here it's just going to query. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And we have, t um, sometimes we have a job title, but we at least have a name and an email address. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that one quick, just so that I don't. Combined with what you can find on LinkedIn, you exactly. can be pretty, pretty accurate with your phishing. Exactly, and the only reason I closed that so quickly is just because I, I don't like the idea of potentially doxing people. So, um, so back to the actual presentation. Um, uh, really quickly, um, I'm the co-founder of Through the Hacking Glass. It's a mentoring platform. Uh, basically, it's aiming to bridge the gap between what you learn in academia and what you get from certifications and what industry wants. Um, I can't guarantee that we'll give you 14 years of Ethereum experience, but uh, we will certainly uh, give you experience in something. We're working with vendors to get uh, NFR licenses so that you can actually use things that you would use in the field, and we're not allowing the salespeople to try to sell to you. We're just saying, hey, this is what you're up to. So, um, on Twitter at Hacking Glass, Facebook.com slash Hacking Glass. Um, the link, uh, we are using a MailChimp um, mailing list to uh, record everything right now in terms of membership. So, the link is on both Twitter and Facebook. Uh, also, we're in dire need of mentors. We've got about a 13 to 1 mentee to mentor ratio right now. So, um, we need uh, people to be mentors. You can be a mentor and a mentee. But we, we definitely need um, more mentors so that we don't have to do it in cohorts. 
Uh, my upcoming speaking engagements, uh, I'm given training uh, the 1st of June at Layer 8, uh, and then uh, also nearby we've got Hacker Halted, and I'll be at the Texas Cyber Summit as well. Um, with Hacker Halted, everybody likes free stuff, right? There's a coupon code to get into Hacker Halted for free. Tickets are normally $200. Um, make note of it, share it with whoever you want. Uh, keynotes, um, actually in the audience, Jeff Mann will be speaking. Um, but uh, keynotes are uh, Paul Asadorian, Jenny Radcliffe, Ian Coldwater, uh, and there's a couple more that I just can't think of off the top of my head. So it's going to be good. Um, and then there's a coupon code for training as well. So uh, the days leading into the event, they'll have all of their certifications uh, for training. Uh, also, with the training, um, on June 7th, uh, you'll get admission to Layer 8. Uh, the 8's silent in the slide. Uh, it was taking a break. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, the training day is uh, June 7th. It's an eight-hour social engineering and open source intelligence course. Uh, the information to do that is at the bottom. And, I mean, if there was just like this... Con I mean, Northern Virginia is such a good place for a conference. I just can't think of anything to go with it. So... All right. Uh, besides Nova, our next conference is next year, March 6th and 7th, 2020. I, this is the first time I'm announcing it, so you're the first one to know. Uh, CFP will open October 6th, and it's usually open until January 6th. Uh, we love submissions, so please feel free to spread the word. Uh, you can also find us at besidesnova.org and on Twitter. Um, with that, we are opening the floor to questions. And to jumpstart that, I would like to query the audience to tell me what are some of the good fish that they've seen out there. Anyone? Should I call on names? All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Those are definitely crafty. And, and for those who couldn't hear him, he was just talking about reusing old emails uh, as a current fish. Anyone else? A good one that I've seen that's been very efficient is from the HR department saying they've changed their rules on what you can and cannot post on Twitter. Employees are so freaked out, they don't even think twice. They click on the link to see where are the rules. Yeah, we've got a few people with that one. Uh, anyone has any fun stories? Jeff Matt, I'm calling on you. Uh, <laughs> if you leave it hit by one, I'm trying to remember the details. Um, basically, they, they actually hit one of our interns, and it was something about uh, you need to reset your password. Yeah. Go to this website. <laughs> it was that easy, huh? I probably sent that one. <laughs> yeah, most likely. What was funny was it actually happened at the same time we were going through a security awareness training. phishing training exercise. So the <laughs> fake one was the real one. It's fake news. <laughs> so one that I've um, always wanted to do, but I've never got anyone to agree to actually let me do it, is I just want to spam people like every day for like a month with like this bogus newsletter and purposely not have an unsubscribe button at the bottom and then whenever I finally choose to do it I'm going to send an email apologizing for being in violation of the USA Can Spam <laughs> Act and say click here to unsubscribe. Oh, that is a good one. Didn't think about that one. Yeah. So that's pretty crazy. Yes. It was like a US thing a couple years ago and then like click here to see if your computer is vulnerable. And that actually was when the ADS was like uh, something like that's just so over the top. It's like when, when, like when I'm planning something like that, I'm like, their users can't be that um, naive. Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, I'm not gonna say anything. Yeah. Um. So, um, like a story about a really good campaign that I ran. Um, so, according to the Semantic ISTR, the global average rate is like 13%. So, with this campaign, I got 42%, and this is after I only got about 60% of the emails out and got blocked three hours in. So, it was a grocery chain. Uh, it was not Walmart, I'll tell you that now. It was a small grocery chain in a regional area. Uh, their CEO was retiring the next week, and the COO was taking over. So... 
Uh, basically, I went out, I found some press releases, I copied and pasted it in there, I bought the US to there.com, did all the infrastructure with uh, what I was talking about, the $25 deal, stood it up, sent the email out. Uh, one thing that was really notable, similar to Walmart, they didn't call their employees employees. It was like it was like member owner or something. I don't I don't remember. Associates. Well, that, that for Walmart it's associates, but for this company it was like member owner or something to that effect. And basically, I just sent them low and slow, like ten to fifteen at a time, uh, and I would wait a few minutes in between each one. I got about sixty percent of them out, and then I started getting bounce as blocks, and I was like, hmm. So then. Um, my security point of contact forwards me what their network uh, head had sent out to everyone. Well, then when they they forwarded the email and said, "Don't click this." Like, what is it that I'm not supposed to click? <laughs> Let me click it to see what I don't need to click. And what it was is it had the Mailchimp. The first page was what's your email address and password, and then the next page was like password reset questions, like your mother's maiden name, your school. But I never asked the mother's maiden name. Uh, anyone who sees me out on the street, you'll see me asking questions like, "Hey, what was your mom's name before she was married?" And like in the South, like I'm from Tennessee, uh, I'll, I'll just stroll up on somebody and be like, "Who's your mama's people?" Works like a champ. Um, I, I, it might even work out on Bourbon Street. I might have to try that tonight. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, with that, I asked those questions on the third page. It was originally a logic flaw. It was like an infinite loop on that third page that said, sorry, the survey's closed. And originally I was like, do I want to fix this? Mm, maybe. And I was like, no, I want, I want someone to report me. And I think that may have been what saved them. And then I waited a couple of weeks and I was closing the account out. Uh, I had already taken down the web server, but I was closing out the Google account before I got billed for a second month. I mean, you know, $5 is hard to come by sometimes. Um, but anyway, uh, the now CEO, uh, of whom I had spoofed, well, squatted, was on seven internal ultra-sensitive mailing lists, and it was going to the wrong account. I had this, this guy's schedule, I saw, like, confidential company information, got meeting invites, I just forwarded it to the, the company, like, my point of contact, I'm not gonna say what he said, but it rhymes with something that might walk and sound like a duck. <laughs> uh, and it, he, he was rather concerned about that. So, um, and then basically after that, they had everybody reset their password, and I stood everything up for password reset dot whatever it is. And they're like, okay, in 60 days, come pitch us a new fish. Okay, cool. And uh, I pitched it. I wrote everything up. I sent it. Uh, I made my vice president aware because this was a, a previous position, and. Uh, I had gotten on his bad side somehow, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, he calls me by to come to his office. I was like, oh boy, I'm in trouble again. What have I done? So I go there. He's like, they're not going with your fish. Because what it was, was I was going to say something to the effect of, as some of you may know, uh, approximately 60 days ago, a malicious adversary ran a phishing campaign and compromised some, some credentials. So we subscribed to a service that watches the dark web for uh, our passwords, and everyone in the organization's passwords have been compromised. Click here to reset it. And that hence the password reset dot whatever the TLD is. So, um, yeah, they said no. <laughs> but, oh, easily. And I'm pretty sure the network guy was actually one of them that fell for the original fish, so that's probably why he blocked me so quick. Yes, Jeff? I remember what it was. When I was spooked, boy, you got it. It was an intern. And it was, there was, here's this document that you need to read. If you clicked on it, it went to a site asking you to put in your domain credentials to unlock the here's the document. Hmm. Rather sinister. Ever. Yes. My favorite one this year. I work for University. Mm -hmm. uh, this year we went to get the department head's name for our website. Email the department. The first email would be, hey, I'm in a meeting. I have a really important task for you. You're busy. And then more employees that I'm comfortable with sharing would reply and say, no, I'm not. What do you need? The next mail was, I need you to go to the store and buy me IT gift cards. Stress them off. <laughs> Send me the picture. So thankfully, most people knew it was a scam at that point. We had one traveling person call. There's a guy with a PhD. He says, I did it. I'm like, what do you mean? So I, I sent them a picture of the car that I bought. So we're like, all right, well, you got scammed for 20 bucks. You know, what's the money? He's like, 
No, no, it was $500. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. We're so removing your PhD. Called them, and they refunded the money. They told them it was a scam, which was very surprising. All that money spent on a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, I don't understand the whole thing about the Apple gift cards. Somebody in the audience may actually know, but like, what do these people do? Like, just get the gift cards and like run some like fake app and you transfer them into your Apple Pay account. Ah. My fishing game's about to change. <laughs> <laughs> to improve. What are they doing? buying music with it? Right. I was like, yeah, because I was like, Apple Music's nine bucks a month, and you can listen to whatever. Why do you need a, like? Do you have like? You know, 50 people who want to listen to, you know, Leonard Skinner all the time. So, I don't know. Um, we got a little bit more time. Anyone else? If not, then that's all, folks. All right. Oh, we do have one. one. more. Uh, just go a little more of the attribution tools, the attempted attribution tools. Of yes, they're definitely attempted. Okay, yeah. Uh, so. Just curious, like, even the, the points of that and what you'd hope to accomplish. Okay, so <laughs> with, within the email, if you're receiving the email, there's a good chance someone else is receiving the email. So by using things like OTX, like Threat Miner, like Threat Crowd, I would say start at Threat Miner and then just use it to pivot out because it's connected to everything else, except for, I don't think it's tied into IBMs, but it's there too. Uh, and there, I mean, there are others out there as well. Uh, but basically, you can take the source of the email, look at the email address that it proposed, uh, that it claims to be, the where it actually came from, uh, the IP address that it came from, all of that fun stuff. Drop it in there, and then see what is this tied to. So uh, things like like Locky, the exploit kit associated with Locky, uh, there was a huge phishing campaign that actually deployed that. So there were a lot of things that were very similar in the deployments of that exploit kit. So in doing so, by having that or the like the hash of anything that they try to get you to download, uh, then you're able to say, yes, this is... You're, you're basically looking for a signature to see if someone else has already done the analysis. If you're the one groundbreaking the analysis, it might be a little bit different. But, I mean, if you're groundbreaking, you might even be able to find some malware that's never been seen before and name it. After you. Yeah. Big deal in the community. So that's basically that's what you're doing. Like, it's operating under the idea of if I'm having this problem, someone else is probably having this problem. The same reason why I love doing OSINT on like Stack Overflow, or looking at like mailing lists that have since been um, archived into a website. Uh, during the DerbyCon SCCTF, I found um, that my target company was using a specific storage array, and they had been having problems because the guy did not take his uh, his signature line out. He didn't even work there anymore, but the damage was done. So, stuff like that. I mean, it's it's a dime a dozen. Anyone else? Okay, if there's nothing else, then that's all, folks. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.